Our gospel lesson this morning will continue where we started last week with the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is such an important part of our faith. It's something we pray each week. And I think it's important for us as the Lord taught us to pray this prayer for us to really dig in to see what it's talking about. So we're going to continue with the Lord's Prayer as we find in Matthew. So we were reading Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. We're focusing specifically on verse 10. So the Lord's Prayer is found in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 through 13. Pray then in this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We want to focus today, last week we talked, we, Brian did a, and Aaron both did a wonderful job of talking to us about the first verse, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Today we're going to look at verse 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. One of the best books that I've ever really read um, dealing with prayer, where it really was a chapter within a book was a book written, it's a classic of Christian literature in the last century, uh, written by a man by the name of Richard Falster. It's a book called Celebration of Discipline. It's a wonderful book. And if you've not read A Celebration of Discipline, you, you need to add that to your reading list. It, it's one you definitely, that every Christian should read and every Christian should spend some time with. Because what this book does is it talks about the different disciplines of the Christian life, prayer, scripture, fasting, Worship, service, things such as this, all, all the different disciplines that we Christians are commanded by our Lord to do. And it examines them and it talks about them and, and it gives you some good methods for how to improve in each of these disciplines. But it talks of the reason why these disciplines are important to our life. And, and Foster spends, um, spends a, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful chapter on prayer. He, he later wrote a book on prayer, which is equally as good. But I was so impacted by um, when I in college when I read a celebration of discipline and I, I read about prayer and, and what prayer uh, means and what prayer it, it should do uh, for us as Christians. It, it, it is such an important concept because Foster really criticizes us as Christians for praying what he calls weak prayers. We 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 pray weak. Prayers, because so often our prayers are like, particularly our intercessory prayers, are like, um, Lord, you know, do this, you know, if it's your will, or Lord, Lord, you know, I don't want to overstep here, but if you would be so gracious as to do this, you know, would you, if it's your will, we always add if it's your will, and that's, I understand where that comes from. I do the same thing, because we always want to approach God with humility. We want to approach our our prayer life with humility. Uh, you know, we, 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 we understand that, that ultimately prayer is God's business, not ours. Like, you know, we go to God on his terms, on his, and so who are we to, who are we to demand anything of God? And I, I get that. I, I do get that. But when you look at what Scripture actually says about prayer, and we think about what prayer actually is, it can kind of change that dynamic. Because one of my favorite parables of Jesus in the New Testament, it's a parable often called the, the, the unjust judge. There's this parable Jesus tells about um, this, uh, this widow who has a complaint that she makes to this judge. And the, the Bible has this great line. It says that this judge, he feared neither God nor man. But this widow came to him over and over and over and over again with her concern and with her request. And the scripture says that this, God, this judge, though he feared neither God nor man, granted her request because she would not leave him alone. Then Jesus says, we should pray in the same way. We should pray in the same manner. We should be so persistent in our prayers that we wear out God. That we should just come to God over and over and over and over and over and over and again with our prayers. We should pray boldly. We should ask boldly because the Bible says that God will grant us the desires of our hearts. Once again, you've got to keep that in context. Because what Scripture says is that God will grant us the desires of our hearts. But Scripture says that God will first change our hearts. And that God will grant our desires of our hearts because our hearts' desires will be God. We will desire God. 
we'll desire what he wants. And our, God will bring our will in line with his will. So what will happen is that the things that we desire within our hearts will be the things that God desires for us. When our will is brought perfectly in line with God's will, as we become sanctified and holy, then what we desire will be what God desires for us. So if I'm praying, Lord, grant me a Ferrari, you got to ask, is that really in line with God's will? Is that really what God's desiring for me? Does God desire for me to have a Ferrari? Or does God desire for me to know him better, to love him more, and to serve him more, and to be in a better relationship with him? Well, obviously, he wants me to know him more. So we, uh, we have not because we ask not, is what Foster reminds us of in his book. So I think of that in regard to our Lord's Prayer today. Because I talked about how Scripture says we should pray, but then there's another concept that Foster talks about in this book. And it talks about how uh, the relationship between a parent and a child goes. And so those of you who have children, particularly young children, those of you who have grandchildren, you know that your children and your grandchildren don't come to you and say, Father, if it is your will, can I please have an additional scoop of ice cream after dinner? If, if, it is, if it's your will. Father, can, can, can I please have a rainbow unicorn for my birthday? If, if, if it's your will. No, of course not. A child asks boldly of their parents, of their, of their grandparents especially. They ask boldly. They're not afraid to ask for what they want. They're not afraid to ask for their heart's desire because they know, they know, they, they ask boldly because they know that the parents, they know that the mother, the father, the grandparents, that these adults love them perfectly and want what's best for them. So they're not afraid to ask boldly. They're not afraid to ask for big things and bold things because they know that ultimately whatever they ask for, it's not going to impact the relationship with the parent because the parent loves them fully. And that the parent, the parent can grant it. If it's good for the kid, the parent's going to typically do it. Jesus says, which of you, if your child asked for bread, would give him a serpent? None of you. He said, and if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more does your perfectly heavenly father know how to give you good gifts? So a child asks boldly of the parent because the child knows that the parent loves them. Is that how we pray? Do we truly know and think about and ponder just how much our Father loves us? Does that knowledge of God's love for us seep into our prayer life and affect how we pray and what we ask for? And frankly, how we ask. Foster tells us over and over again in this book that we should ask boldly because we are loved by our Father. Why, why am I telling you all this? Well, I'm telling you this because of all the parts of the Lord's Prayer, today's verse may be the biggest ask that we ask of God in this prayer. It may be the biggest request we make of God. It might be the most out, outlandish thing that we as the prayer prays during this prayer. And I don't think we think about it. I think if we're going to be honest, we just kind of rotely say this line and we really don't think about what it is we're asking God for today. Today's prayer is a huge ask of God. And we need to be very careful when we pray it. We need to really think about what it is we're asking of God. One of my, one of my favorite things I was always told about Wesley was that when someone was converted at one of his revivals, he wouldn't always accept the conversion on the spot but he would make the person go home and sleep and come back the next day and reaffirm that commitment. Or he would make them go for a walk around the block and come back and reaffirm that commitment because he, wa he really he wanted them to think about what it meant to truly accept Jesus Christ as Lord. What does it truly mean to really 
ask Jesus Christ to be Lord of your life. Wesley wanted the individual to truly think about that and truly ponder what that meant in their life and in their faith. Today, we're asking for God's kingdom to come upon the earth. We're asking for God's will to be done perfectly upon earth like it is in heaven. We're asking for the messianic kingdom to come perfectly. The perfect kingdom that we see in Revelation. When it says that God will wipe away every tear from our eye. We're asking for God's kingdom to come. Maranatha, Lord. We're like, that sounds awesome. We love that. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be great if Jesus came back now and God's kingdom was established now? And Wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah, it would be. But if we're going to ask for God's kingdom to come upon the earth now, what we're really asking for is for God's kingdom to come within us now. For God's will to be done perfectly in us and through us now. Not just some theoretical them out in the world. Not just some theoretical world, but we're asking for God's kingdom to come and for God's will to be done here on the earth. Well, that first starts with God's kingdom coming within my heart and God's kingdom coming within your heart. God's kingdom coming within our church and God's will be done perfectly within my heart and within your heart. What will that look will that look like? Look like will that, what will that even mean to say for God's will to be done perfectly, for God's kingdom to come perfectly? That would mean that we would insist and we would live, we would want this world to live under God's rules and live under God's commands and live and play. See, the world plays by its own rules now. The world plays by power and greed and pride and things like that. That's what the world plays by. For God's kingdom to come, it means we now no longer play by the world's rules, but it means we play by God's rules. And in God's rules, every life is sacred. Genesis 1 says that we were made in the image of God. In the image of God, he made the male and female. He made them. That means that every life, if God's kingdom is going to come, that means we have to live with the understanding that every life has value. That means that the life of the unborn has value. The life of the most vulnerable among us, the unborn, has value. We have to live with that reality and live with that understanding and promote a culture of life. But it also means that so many of the divisions that we create within this world, divisions of race and class and things like that, have to go away. And that we can't live with distinctions anymore. As Paul says, there's neither male nor female, Greek nor Jew, slave nor free, for we're all one in Christ. Because in Christ's kingdom, these divisions that the world places upon us, and frankly, these divisions that we place upon us must go away. Every life is valued. Every life has worth. Do we really live like that? We want to live like that. I mean, that's gonna it's gonna upset the apple cart, isn't it? See, here's the thing: when we live by God's kingdom, we live with His will being done perfectly on earth as it is in heaven. Is he goes from preaching to meddling. That's why this is a, a big ask. And frankly, it's not just a big ask of God. But it's a big ask of us. Are we really, really living, willing to live like that? Do we really want to live with every life being of sacred worth? In God's kingdom, our relation to him is primary. So that's the primary relationship in our life, the primary determining factor of our life. 
And so for his kingdom to come perfectly upon the earth, that means that our relationship with God is going to be the directing force of everything in our life. Not earthly success, our finances, our glory, or anything like that. But our relationship with him will be the determining factor and the primary motivator, the primary factor of every part of our life. To put about God's rules means that we will come to the understanding as well that all of life is about worshiping him. The Bible says that he wants a living sacrifice. It says you want it says you honor me with the words, but your hearts are far away. To play by God's rules means that we understand the truth of Colossians 3.17. And everything you do in word or deed, do it to the glory of God the Father through Jesus Christ the Son. That, that not just every action must be seen and filtered through our relationship with God being the primary impactor. But that everything we do, everything we do is an act of worship to God. Everything we do should give glory to God. Everything, every, there's not a single thing in our life that we should be doing that is not about bringing God glory. If his kingdom's going to come and his will's going to be done, then our entire purpose of life is to give God glory. That's it. That's it. Not to give me glory. Not to do things that are good for me or make me look good. Not to grow my success. But to give glory to God. a lot y'all I'm not sure that I necessarily want to do that sometimes that's a big ask to ask God to be the priority for all of our life to think about how that affects everything think about how that affects everything if we're going to live by his kingdom domain, his kingdom rule, his perfect will being done on the earth means his perfect will first starts in my heart. God's kingdom being the north star for every decision we make. I mean, you have to ask, how, what does it look like for God's will to be the north star for every decision? decision that I make. Every one of them. That doing God's will is the guiding principle for every decision I make. God's will is a guiding directive for every relationship that I'm in. Every action within my relationship. The way I treat my spouse. The way I treat my children. The way I treat my co-workers. The way I treat my neighbors. The way I treat the folks at Walmart. Living out God's will, being the primary driver for every decision that I make, for every relationship that I'm in, for every purchase that I make. Is God's will the primary driver for every purchase that I make? Is God's will the primary driver for every comment that I make? Is God's will the primary driver for every social media post that I make? If we're going to want God's kingdom to come, and for God's will to be done upon the earth, that means we're going to have to make sure that God's will is being done in my life and in your life and in our life as a church and that God's will being done perfectly is the primary driver for every part of our life. Our words, our actions, our thoughts, our schedules. What if God's will, the perfect fulfillment of that, was in charge of our calendar. How would that change how we spend our time? That's a lot, y'all. And we we think about that, we think, well, I don't, (laughs) I can't live like that. That's where I think that passage I said earlier, Colossians 3.17 is so important. Where Paul writes, and everything you do in word or deed, do it to the glory of God through Jesus Christ the Son. 
God's not calling us necessarily. Now, maybe he is called. I'm not going to presuppose what the Holy Spirit's calling you to do. Maybe the Spirit is calling you to this. But for most of us, I doubt the Spirit is calling us to withdraw from human society like the early desert fathers and mothers who moved out into the deserts of Egypt. I don't know that God's actually calling us to that. But he is calling us to live under that directive of Colossians 3.17. And everything we do in word or deed, do it to the glory of God the Father, to Jesus Christ the Son. Everything we do, everything we do, y'all, everything we do is done to the glory of God the Father through Jesus Christ the Son. That's what it means ultimately for his kingdom to come and for his will to be done. Is that everything we do, every action, Every thought, every purchase, everything, everything is done for God's glory through Jesus Christ the Son. All of our life is a gift of worship to God. All of it. From the moment we wake up in the morning to the moment we go to bed at night. Our work, our play, all of it. It's a gift of worship. Worship is not just an hour on Sunday morning, y'all. The Bible says we are a living sacrifice. All of our life. All of our life. All of our life is worship. All of it. Every last moment is a gift of worship to God. All of our life is a gift of service to God. The little things, y'all. God's not, I mean, once again, I don't want to say that God's not calling you to something big. But sometimes the most Christian thing you can do is be nice to the checkout girl at Walmart. Sometimes the, the, not, the most Christian thing you can do is let somebody out in traffic. Sometimes the most Christian thing you can do is refrain from wrath or anger. Sometimes the most Christian thing you can do is to not send the email and just take a moment and think about it before you hit send. Sometimes the most Christian thing we can do is apologize. Sometimes the most Christian thing we can do is just tell somebody you love them. Rich Mullins, my favorite Christian singer, said one time that, Sometimes raking your neighbor's yard is the most spiritual act you'll ever do. To live giving glory to God with all things means that it affects every act of service in our life. All of life is worship. All of life is service. Because after all, isn't the greatest commandment to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbor as we love ourselves? To worship God and to serve our neighbor is the gospel fully lived out. Because that brings glory to God. And it points folks to Jesus. And y'all, that's what it's all about. That's what the kingdom looks like. Is love of God and love of neighbor lived out fully and radically. Now, yeah, this is a this is a big ask, y'all. It is. It is. This is this is us basically asking to reformat our life and live by different principles in the world and live by different different guiding principles in the world. But how's it work in living for the world? Every one of us has within us a whole I've heard it called, but many people are God-shaped whole. That we fill with stuff. And we, we try to numb it, the emptiness sometimes. But you fill with good things, family and friends and activities. But even they leave us empty. The only way life makes sense, ultimately, is for God's will to be done perfectly within our life. And that feels like a lot. It feels like it's going to be hard. And, and we're going to get it wrong a lot. <laughs> we're going to get it wrong a lot. That's why forgiveness of sins is so important. We're going to talk about forgiveness of sins later. Don't worry. We're going to get there. We're going to, we're going to get to forgiving sins. Don't worry. We're, it's coming. But think about what changes in our life and in the world. When we live that out. I think we all know things need to change, don't we? In the world, in our culture, in our country. 
the first step to renewal, the first step to things truly changing, is for us to do what we pray. It's by His grace and through His power. Let His kingdom come and His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In this world, yes. In our church, yes. In you, yes. But first, Lord, in me. First, Lord, in me. May his kingdom come within me. May his will be done within me. And think what happens when we all do it. That's when revival comes. That's when renewal comes. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Lord, may it be so. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the gift of this prayer that you taught us to pray. God, and may we understand what it is we're praying. May we understand the power within these words. And may we live them out fully today in each day of our lives. We love you. We ask it in Christ's sweet and holy name. Amen.